hi. Um, wow, this video seems even less likely than the last one. I was really like surprised by the response to the video that I posted a couple of weeks ago about my experiences with tramadol withdrawal. Um, the reason I'm surprised is because I didn't think many people would have had a similar experience to need to watch it. I thought maybe, you know, the old cliche, if you could reach one person, maybe somebody would find it useful as a kind of heads up on what they could be heading into um, with tramadol withdrawal. Um, the response has been really overwhelming actually. The comments of which there are over a hundred now, um, that's a lot for me and one of my videos, are quite heartbreaking at times. People are going through a really tough time. Lots and lots of people. I mean the video is being viewed hundreds of times a day at the moment, which obviously points to a big problem. There seems to be lots of people who are dealing with tramadol withdrawal or similar opioid withdrawal and the same stories keep popping up people are telling me that my experience is relatable because people feel they were over prescribed tramadol they weren't given fair warning about the addictive nature of it and how hard it would be to give it up if they ever chose to give it up or wherever you know if I felt well enough to give it up um it's been a minority of troll type behavior people denying that um post-acute withdrawal symptom is even a thing and that you should be over it within a week. It's probably worth acknowledging that at least one doctor was really surprised that I had any problems after a while because they felt that within about 10 days the whole episode should have been over with. Um, and as, well, if you've seen the last video, you know it went on for the best part of a year, I guess. It's only really since turning the 12-month mark was the magic moment when I started to feel pretty normal again. So I promised a few people in the comments that I would make this video which is a bit more of an in-depth into um, how I actually stopped it, what I actually did in terms of things that I found useful. I'm going to talk about some of the things that I regret doing. There's a couple of key things that I think were not good ideas that I did and maybe in this video there are a few tips for anyone who's going through this. Um, you have nothing but respect and solidarity from me. It is a really traumatic ordeal but it is possible to get through it and life can be a lot better on the other side. So I'm going to talk about what I did, what I didn't do, what I wish I'd done etc etc. So a few things to get out of the way first of all, a few important caveats. Everyone's circumstance is different. I want to just acknowledge some of the privileges that have allowed me to do this in the way that I did. First things first, if you don't know, if the accent didn't give it away, I am British and I am based in the UK. And that's quite important because the UK has a free at the point of use a health service. It's not actually free, but that's a longer topic for another video but at the point of use it's free to the user which means that any healthcare emergencies the anxiety attacks the regular trips to the gp i didn't pay for any of that uh, at the point of use i've paid for it elsewhere as a taxpayer in this country but i am not paying out i'm not being hit with bills when i had to call an ambulance or when I was advised to go straight to the emergency room. A lot of people who are commenting on this are based in countries where private healthcare is the norm and health insurance is the norm. So yeah, that's going to make it a bit different for me. Other things that are relevant to this, uh, I want to acknowledge a certain amount of financial privilege. I want to acknowledge the privilege that I could actually afford to do this in the sense that I work for myself. I don't have like, I wasn't going to lose my job and I'm not in a financial position where I could have risked losing my home as a result of this. My life is at a point where it's pretty stable. I've certainly experienced real poverty and there's times in my life where I've had this have happened, I couldn't have risked making such a big change to my life because I probably would have lost my home or my job or probably both so that's pretty significant as well. Yeah another thing that's worth mentioning is the most common strategy you'll find on YouTube for getting through tramadol withdrawal is uh, taking something a herbal plant thing I'm going to pronounce this wrong it's either kratom or kratom I don't know as far as I'm aware it's not something that's available in the UK so I never took that I don't really know what it is I know it's something that people have said is very helpful um, so I couldn't comment on that because um, I have no idea and I didn't take it okay so first things first I might just pull up the comments so I'm just looking at the video now and just looking at some of the comments and it's all like lots of people you know, everyone's experience is different and I don't 
presume that my experience is reflective of anyone else's. I certainly didn't make the video saying, oh, this is what's going to happen to you. But as it happens, a lot of people are reporting similar things and there's similar side effects and things that go on when you do this. Um, restless legs, let's talk about that for a second. You feel like your muscles are trying to crawl off your bones. Wow, that sounds really gross, doesn't it? Um, but that's what it feels like. And especially at night, my legs were just really like thrashing around and it was really, really difficult to get still and get comfortable enough that I could try and get some sleep. So my pro tip for that would be some kind of weighted blanket. As it happens, I bought a uh, weighted blanket that was just way too heavy and was really uncomfortable. I just thought buy the heaviest one that was there, which seems like a ridiculous idea afterwards. So I didn't use that so much. What I actually used was blankets and things and just got the weight just right. So don't necessarily rush out and buy a weighted blanket for that purpose. Um, you might do, um, but it's difficult to gauge how heavy you need it until you experience it. So quite often I ended up using blankets and clothes and things actually just to like weigh my legs down and I found that to be pretty helpful in terms of dealing with the restless legs you're probably well worth having these kind of strategies in place before you start um, doing this. And don't just take my word for it. Look around, watch other videos, get a sense of what's popular on YouTube if you're doing your research on YouTube and don't restrict your research just to YouTube. Uh, first person kind of lived experience stuff like this video is helpful and it certainly helped me. Even this video, take it all with a pinch of salt um, because everyone's experience is going to be different, right? One thing I really regret doing is that I carried on working. I'm self-employed, I'm a musician here in the UK and I can pick and choose my battles when it comes to work and yet I carried on working a lot and it was pretty messy. I don't think I let anyone down but I'm kind of shocked. I was working on Zoom a lot because of the pandemic but I mean for example I had a Zoom training day that I was running from sort of 9 till 3 o'clock in, in 9 in the morning till 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Zoom training other musicians and I didn't get out of the emergency room till about 4 a.m. and you know like common sense would be just don't do it like cancel the work if possible and I could have done and it wouldn't have made that big a difference I was just really really stubborn about it affecting my career so I got through that. Lesson learned if you're able to take a bit of time if you're able to block out a couple of weeks to get through the worst of it without having work commitments, then that would be massively advantageous to you. Although, again, checking my privileges here, that's easy for me to say as someone who works for themselves and ha normally has a bit of a financial buffer that, you know, a couple of weeks of not working is not gonna make a big difference to my lifestyle. However, that could be the difference between having a roof over your head and not for some people. So, again, pinch of salt recommended what else you've just got to rest that's the that's the flip side of it you really have just got to rest and that's why i think you need that time off and i didn't rest enough as luck would have it the i'm a big basketball fan and the nba was back up and running was it in the bubble season yeah i just watched a lot of basketball just, and just tuned out for like hours and hours at a time and it was that was definitely better and easier to do than obviously trying to work through it all dehydration i think like is a big part drink plenty of water really do drink a lot of water um nobody drinks enough water that's just a fact i'm sure of it just just stay hydrated and rest those are the first things that matter probably the most significant like thing in terms of just having a bit of a handle on the inevitable kind of anxiety peaks and troughs um, it's a very popular thing to talk about at the moment that's meditation or mindfulness practice and there's loads of stuff out there to help you do that i would recommend the 10 percent happier app is what i use there's some very specific meditations for anxiety on there i believe you can get a free trial for that for like 30 days i think um it's available on um ios and android it was devised by dan harris who is a uh news reader we would call them in the uk i'm not sure what the us job title is but he's a a news anchor, I think the term I'm looking for is, um, who famously had a panic attack on national television. Um, that was actually drug related. Um, 
have a look at Dan's story. You can find it on YouTube. And through a lo very long uh, process, he discovered meditation. And now he runs a really amazing meditation uh, app and website. And there's books and all sorts of a kind of meditation mini empire called 10% Happier. And that's the app that I use. There are loads of others, of course. What's the other one? Calm. Calm is that. There's loads of stuff on YouTube. There's, in, there's enough stuff. You just need mindfulness practice where you are focused on some kind of thing other than your anxiety and usually that's the breath now weirdly enough i struggle to focus on my breath and because i was having breathing problems during withdrawal that was really difficult for me so i used like touch points so i would hold my hands like this and just really focus on the experience of my fingers touching that sounds really random and strange putting it like that but just completely concentrating on that as a focus for meditation because Focusing on the breath happens to be something that I'm really bad at, despite being someone who meditates every day. I find um, that kind of meditation not very helpful um, and quite difficult for whatever reason. So if you can manage with the breath, then great, because that's what most meditation apps and things are going to tell you to do. There are other ways to meditate. You can just do have a look at like body scan meditation, uh, meta meditation. There's different techniques, but really... At the heart of it, in terms of the process that we're talking about, you're just trying to get your mind off the experience of the anxiety cycles that are likely to come your way in the withdrawal phase. Very light exercise helped me, and I can't stress enough how light that was. I've been up and down with periods of physical activity, but I've been times when I've been quite strict about the gym. Obviously, coming off the back of lockdown and stuff, I wasn't in great shape when I started this, which is something to bear in mind. Yeah, I couldn't do much exercise, um, and I obviously didn't have access to a gym at this point in time. You may not either, but it was enough to just get out in the garden and just take a few steps, do a few very light stretches with a band. I mean, I'm talking really, really minimal exercise, but doing very, very light exercise is really helpful with the muscle tightness and the cramps and things that you're going to experience get some fresh air as much as you can on that note on the note of fresh air and um getting outside i found that really helpful one thing i did wrong i think in retrospect is i timed this really really wrong i did this in the depths of winter i realized how much that had made it worse it was around february last year and there was a day of like just a really nice sunny day, which was, you know, it was really cold and miserable around that time in the UK. And there was just like one really sunny day. And I felt so much better, like for just being outside and getting some sunlight on my skin was just, it really, it felt amazing after what I'd been through. Um, so yeah, I would say that's probably my single biggest mistake. And someone actually mentioned that in the comments that they thought that doing it in winter, they thought about it and they weren't going to do it now because it's cold, because it's winter in a lot of places. And I was like, yeah, that's that's definitely a good idea. Don't do it in the winter if you can. If you can time this in the summer when there's sunlight and it's easier to get outside, obviously that depends on where you live. Here in the UK, that's a bit hit and miss. So yeah, I really wish I'd done it in the summer. I think it would have been much easier. And I think it would have been a shorter episode had I had that because it was when the weather got better that you know a bit of it doesn't take a genius to work it out sunlight is going to boost vitamin d it's going to boost serotonin levels it's you're going to feel better um in the sunlight right again on that note i i started taking vitamin d right towards the end of this process i feel like that helped me in terms of anxiety there's limited research out there that does support the idea that vitamin d probably does help with anxiety as well as the stuff that we know that it does like skin bone health that sort of thing but vitamin d there's emerging evidence that it's good for anxiety and anecdotally i felt the difference and i wish i'd started the vitamin d supplements sooner in fact i wish i'd started the vitamin d supplements before i'd started doing this anecdotally i hear people talking about cbd oil the legal variety of um cannabis oil that you can buy in the high streets in lots of places um I bought some and I tried it. I don't I don't know if it did anything actually to be honest because I was right in the depths of the worst of withdrawal. Would withdrawal have been even harder without the CBD oil? I'm not sure. Um I don't know. I'm the, personally I don't know. I read that people have like find it helpful. If you have access to it and it's legal where you are as it is now legal in the UK, then you could try it. Um I don't think it's going to hurt you. Um but I just, I don't know 
for certain that it does anything. Yeah, so those are, the, those are the, my big mistakes. Not taking vitamin D, not resting enough. It's only when I really gave up on trying to do stuff and just rested and just, like, watched sports all day that I started to feel anywhere near human. Uh, time of year, definitely picked the wrong time of year to do it. Starting this in, like, September, October time and then going through... No, wait, yeah, so I had a false start in September where I ended up going back onto Tramadol and then it was November when I got it under control. Um, yeah, bad timing. Okay, here's my big um, approach with caution because this is not medical advice, um, but people talked about Kratom, Kratom, not sure how you pronounce that, um, as being an option uh, for staving off the worst of the opioid kind of withdrawal things. This was my slightly haphazard way of approaching that based on what's available in the UK. So I went to my local chemist and bought what is available over the counter without prescription, a thing called Solpidine Plus, which is a painkiller that contains paracetamol, caffeine and codeine. Eight milligrams of codeine per tablet and you can take a maximum of eight of these. I didn't do this straight away. A couple of weeks in, I was really, really struggling. One of the problems I have is that the tablets that I was on, I couldn't effectively um, cut my dosage down. So I was on 50 milligram tablets at this point when I stopped and like, I just didn't have, I've read of people making solutions and diluting it so you can titrate because they do say if you can titrate down by about 10%, you know, in very gradual steps and you should get over the worst of the withdrawal um, but I didn't have really the skills or anything to make solutions from tramadol and measure out my doses that way but what I found was by taking this I was able to just stave off the worst of like the opioid kind of climbing the walls real train spotting stuff so at eight milligrams per tablet and I took two of these four times a day so that is like 64 milligrams of codeine a day. Now, codeine and tramadol, from what I've read online, are roughly equivalent in terms of their uh, opioid strength. Do just check that. Opioid equivalency charts are easy to find online. Have a look at those. They're normally measured in terms of the equivalent to 10 milligrams of morphine. Most charts I've looked at report 50 to 100 milligrams of tramadol being equivalent to 10 milligrams of morphine. Yeah, with me? That's quite a wide margin. 50 to 100, that's a whole tablet. But around 100 milligrams of codeine would be the same thing. So with that in mind, an entire day's worth of these, like eight of these, is only the equivalent to one, maybe two tramadol tablets. And these, because they were so incremental, there's only eight milligrams of codeine in each of them, it was easy to then just take one out. So I could take these, like eight a day for a couple of days, then I'll take seven. And the bit when I take the seven, so maybe I'll take the two in the morning, two in the afternoon, one in the evening, and then two before bed. And I'll do that for a couple of days. Uh, my GP advised me to do the titration, then go back to normal then do the titration for two days. So eight tablets, seven tablets, eight tablets, seven tablets, seven tablets. When that stabilizes, start again. Seven, six, seven, seven, and so on. But yeah, it's you're still taking an opioid, uh, so definitely approach with caution. And if you take more than the stated dose, then you're going to be in a lot, a lot of trouble. You're asking for all sorts of health problems. But if you can stick to the dose, I found that just even though it's very, very small, a very, very mild opioid compared to the tramadol. Going from tramadol, cold turkey, and then taking these just just took the edge off enough that I could cope with life. And then I found that these tablets were easier. A, these tablets were easier to cut because they're quite big. So I got a pill cutter and I was able to chop them in half. So I could really incrementally over a few days tweak it down. And it didn't take me long to um, get to the point where I didn't need to take these. And t to be honest, like I'd stabilized the worst of the opioid withdrawal, the short term withdrawal was kind of stabilizing with this. And by tapering down in such small increments of like four milligrams less of codeine each day, that wasn't too bad. That was actually pretty bearable. And it wasn't like, it was nowhere near the drop of coming from 
where I was with tramadol when I titrated down. Bearing in mind I was down to 150 milligrams of tramadol when I went kind of cold turkey as we say so by replacing an opioid with that it's, uh, it didn't feel like the ideal thing and it's not really what I wanted to do but it did help obviously I wish I'd planned it a little bit better in terms of like moving on to the over-the-counter codeine because that could have like smoothed out the worst bit I think because I was cold turkey for about two weeks and then started taking that and then did that for just a few weeks just to get it down um, just chopping it out as I say, that was about the best I could do. It is habit forming in itself, so you've really got to be committed to being strong enough to get off it. You don't want to just replace tramadol with that or any other opioid. I wasn't sure if I wanted to talk about this part of it because I don't want to like suggest, put the idea in people's heads of replacing one addiction with another, but I'm aware that the kratom, kratom, however you pronounce it, is also habit forming and people have used it successfully. Yeah, you just got to be sensible and have that finish line in sight that you're going to be free of opioids. Um, but with those, those are my kind of things that kind of help me. So let's just recap that. Uh, weighted blanket or some kind of like weighting down when you're trying to sleep. Lots of water, drink lots of water. Oh yeah, uh, food wise, just try and eat healthily, as healthily as you can. I wish I'd just resisted like you'll get really really bad sugar cravings like you'll just want sweets and stuff and in the short term like just eating fistfuls of haribo will make you feel a lot better but you'll feel much much worse about an hour later so like healthy green vegetables um for me that's a plant-based diet and a very simple plant-based diet as well i just have some rice and broccoli and that kind of thing and that definitely made me feel better when i was able to stick to it and those sugar crashes where i gave in and ate loads of chocolate were not only did I gain a lot of weight in this period, but they made me feel much, much worse. So really, you've really got to fight that. And most of the time, and it's a really annoying thing that people say, when you think you're hungry, you're probably thirsty. So do drink lots of water to get through that. Rest as much as you possibly can, whatever your job or life situation allows you to do. And the less hyperactive your mind is in terms of riding into those anxiety things, because when those anxiety attacks happened I thought well maybe this is it maybe this is the one where I have a heart attack like it's a big old thing it's a right drama and it was just easier to fend that off when I was rested and distracted so distract yourself whether it's a good book movies just like if Netflix binges I don't know whatever floats your boat just just indulge in it like I say that for me that was like you know two or three NBA games a day like that just get out of the mindset of what you're doing as much as possible meditation will help i kind of feel like i ruined meditation for myself a little bit at the time i feel like i can kind of do meditation now without it feeling so closely linked to the withdrawal experience but i think if i hadn't meditated there's definitely some episodes where my panic attacks were reaching the point where like my heart rate was like dangerously high and i was able to control it through meditation so i would say if you're sceptical about the science of meditation and whether I'm just promoting some kind of mumbo-jumbo thing, I would really recommend a book uh, called The Science of Meditation. Also another book called Why Buddhism is True, which talks about the science behind why meditation works. There's good, clear science as to why meditation will help you. So um, I totally understand. I used to be really sceptical about meditation, but there's lots and lots of strong science to support why it will help you. So... That might be some reading material for you during the episode that you might be embarking upon. Um, as I say, very light exercise will help you, of course, if you can. Uh, I'm a wheelchair user. Uh, you know, I have significant mobility problems, but I can walk, so I managed to get up on my feet and do a little bit of exercise. But like, even with my health, my normal mobility problems, and with you know everything that was going on, light exercise was helpful. My attempts to get heavier exercise and do some weightlifting, that sort of stuff, were really disastrous. And I felt really, really ill really quickly. Like, the threshold for whatever you think you can do in the gym, budget for doing, like, 20% of that. Because you really, even if you're reasonably fit and healthy, like, your threshold for exercise just, for me, it just dropped. Like, if I was to try and bench something that I would consider to be manageable, I'd feel like I was having a heart attack even in one rep like just forget about it would be my advice but do get some light exercise yeah important caveats as i said i'm based in the uk the nhs is here so you know when i had panic attacks that were so bad 
I felt I needed medical attention when my heart rate was at like 160 or whatever for, you know, an hour at a time. And I'm just like, can't breathe. The real bad stuff, which I, again, I could have handled that better in the first place. If I'd embraced meditation and a healthy diet and rest earlier, I could have avoided some of those things, I think. But also those trips to the emergency room didn't cost me any money. So that's a massive thing about being here in the UK that made this experience different. Obviously, there are parts of the world where that I would have, yeah, spent a lot of money had I had to pay for all the medical attention that I got through this episode. So, again, checking my privileges there. I think that's everything. Oh, yeah, and then if you can do the maths and you feel confident to just take the edge off it, then over-the-counter uh, cocodamol is essentially what this is. It is primarily paracetamol. I'd recommend just taking paracetamol anyway to bring any sort of fevers and things down, any anti-inflammatories and anything like that's going to help you. And yeah, don't do what I did, which is do it in the winter. And arguably don't do cold turkey in the first place. Titrate down. I could have done this without the cold turkey bit. But I didn't. I was stubborn and I just wanted to do it. So I did it. And here I am. And again, as I said in the last video, like life is good. Life is so much better. And I feel so good about having done this. Life has been very rewarding on the other side all the weird side effects that i'd totally forgotten about in the last year like somebody commented about the fact that like they wanted to stop taking tramadol because the itching was just driving them up the wall and like yeah i totally forgot about that you're so itchy oh my god by about like your fourth dose of the day like my skin would be crawling and i just put up with that and that's one of the side effects that kind of pushed me over the edge just to clarify that's a side effect of taking tramadol not a side effect of going cold turkey so those are the kinds of things that I was glad to get rid of and yeah life is good life feels a lot better fundamentally I'm really proud of myself like I achieved something really really difficult and it set me up for there was this stubborn thing of like if I can beat this then what else could I do and that's the life that I've been living for the last few months and I've done so many things in 2021 I won't bore you with the what I do for a living but in terms of my work as a musician and what it means in the wider scheme of things there's some real firsts and there are things that I pushed myself to do uh, as a musician and as as an artist that I go, yeah, like I found a sense of determination in myself that I didn't know I had. Like I'm really, like what else can I do? And I'm working out, I've got a trainer and I'm like taking my fitness really seriously nowadays and like I find I can really, really push myself psychologically in ways, in healthy ways of like, that I just didn't think was possible because I've got this lived experience of having done this incredibly difficult thing. This video is not about me suggesting you stop taking Tramadol. If it is working for you or any medication, you know what works for you. I know my experience has improved dramatically. My quality of life is so much better without it. And I know lots of people, because you tell me in the comments that there are lots of people who are either trying to get there, have got there and have succeeded and concur that life is much better without that kind of medication there's a big question about pain management afterwards if you're taking it well like me you were given it for a good reason albeit without the right support and advice i guess that's a subject for another video once again um i've talked a lot in this video so i'm going to stop talking right there but i just want to thank everyone who's checked in on this subject I'm really overwhelmed by the comments i'm really genuinely grateful to every single one of you who has shared your story um it's been really emotional, actually, to see what people have been saying about all this. But yeah, thank you. I didn't expect, um, you know, I just make music. I didn't expect more than a couple of people to ever find that video. And so clearly there's a bigger issue than just me going through this experience on my own. And clearly there's a whole situation of um, over-prescribed opioid medication and people are trying to get through it. And... I hope that some of what I've said makes a difference to you if that is your experience. And once again, I'm just really grateful to everyone who shared their stories. It cannot have been easy to do that. Um, so thank you very much. Until next time. Thanks a lot.